we've been talking about deliverance. I remember two weeks ago when I was here, we talked about deliverance. And last week, uh, uh, Pastor Hal talked about God's greatest gift, which is grace. Uh, but we've been talking about deliverance, and we're now in 2 Thessalonians. And I want to let you know that we're going to continue the same theme. I mean, we call it deliverance because uh, Paul said that the Lord delivers us, delivers us from the wrath to come. And the first and second Thessalonians is a very prophetic book. There's a lot of prophecy in it. And one of the things I mentioned, I think, a couple of times now is that we're talking about what's called eschatology, which is the study of the last things. That's not a salvation issue. Many, many people come to Christ without knowing anything about the second coming. There are many people that take a look at the book of Revelation and Daniel, and, Daniel, and they're not quite sure how to interpret it. Uh, they don't take it literally, and that's okay. It's not a matter of salvation. We teach it, however, that what the Bible says is typically what it means. We try to take it as literally as possible. Now, we have a very unusual title for you today, and that title is This Present Delay. You see, when, when Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you and I'm going to come back and receive you to myself, the apostles were looking up in the sky. They're expecting Jesus to return. Paul expected Jesus to return. They called it the blessed hope. At any moment, it was urgent. It was going to, something that was going to happen without delay. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that we're in this present delay? You need to be glad because we wouldn't be here otherwise. If Jesus would have come back 2,000 years ago, none of us would have ever been born. But we get to participate in this thing called the kingdom of God. So for the last 2,000 years, we've had this thing called the church age or the age of grace. And there's something that delays. Today, we're going to be talking about just four verses, okay? So if you think you're going to get out of here early, you're not, okay? Because there's a lot in those four verses. There's a tremendous amount that, the, that Paul wants us to know about the second coming of Jesus Christ and also what is causing this present delay. Um, the author of the book of Hebrews says this. He says specifically to the last days and tells us to encourage each other. Hebrews 10.25 says that we're not to give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So the question is this, what would you do if you knew that Jesus was coming back tomorrow? You continue doing what you're doing today. You continue to meet together, to pray together, to encourage each other. Jesus is coming back and we're supposed to be able to stay, uh, we're supposed to be able to, to stay focused on what we need to do. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll be reading just four verses, verses 5 through 8. Paul says this. He says, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. You know, as, uh, as I said, the, the previous weeks, we talked about that Paul wrote these letters because even though he was with them and spoke a lot on the second coming, on the day of the Lord, they were confused. And that happens. Often when you talk about the day of the Lord, people hear only part of it and they get confused. On top of that, Paul said that there were some that actually sent letters to the people in, in Thessalonica and said they were from Paul. And he said, no, that was, that was not true. Even if you receive a letter from somebody saying it was me, understand what I told you. And he said, remember last time we talked, he said there were two preconditions that needed to be met. Remember? Two preconditions. One was called the falling away. And we said, well, that's kind of hard to describe what that is. Because at any given time, we've had whole countries that used to be basically believers that are no longer believers. And I told you the story of when I was in Europe and I would visit the cathedrals. And it was so sad because so many of these cathedrals were these beautiful buildings. You could only imagine what it was like maybe four or five hundred years ago, maybe just a hundred years ago. When the building, the bells would ring and the church would be filled and people would be worshiping God. But today, most of these cathedrals, in fact, almost all of them are owned by the state. Not only are they owned by the state, but the state also provides the, the salaries for the clergy that are left. And if you happen to be there on a Sunday, like I was, and you decide that you're going to actually go to church, you have to come through the side door, because the visitor come to the front door, 
come through the side door and you want to attend a church service, you'll be maybe one of less than 200 people attending these services. One of the things that I, that I showed you was uh, that there's a group called the nuns, not Catholic nuns, N-U-N-S, it's N-O-N-E-S. And, and um, sociologists have been, have been tracking the number of people in the United States that now say they have no faith at all. Uh, they don't, it isn't like they don't go to church. There's a lot of people that say they're Christians that have been baptized, but they really don't go to church very often. We know that. They go to Christmas and Easter. We call them CEOs, right? Christmas and Easter only. But there's a number of people now say they have no faith. And you can see that it's growing, almost one quarter of the people. And by different categories, if you take a look at the categories, it's the young people, especially the young people. As many as 30, 35% of the youngest generation uh, no longer say they have any faith at all. Uh, the, the greatest generation, uh, the people who uh, have been around World War II, uh, people my age and a little bit older, um, they're the people that have the strongest faith. Less than 8 9% uh, don't have any faith at all. A lot of them still attend churches. So we see this happening. We see this happening. But now they said the other thing that was going to happen, uh, the other thing that was going to happen was that the, uh, we said two preconditions. The second one was that the son of perdition would be exposed, would be revealed. There would be a re revelation of this person, this man, we call him a he, the son of perdition that would, that would be exposed. Now today in verses 5 through 8, we find out a little bit more. We find out that this son of perdition, we call him sometimes the Antichrist, sometimes we call him the lawless one, okay? Um, the, 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 the evil one from the very beginning, this is the one that's spoken of in Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah and the book of Revelation. The uh, book of Revelation just calls him the beast that there's something that's holding him back, something that is restraining, okay? And that causes this present delay, this present delay. And that's exactly what we're gonna talk about today is this, this present delay. Well, one of the things you wanna notice is that in your, in your notes, by the way, it says the first thing we wanna understand is that the man of sin, this lawless one, is a he, a person. There are many people that say, well, this is basically just talking about the force of evil. You know, there's always two choices. You have a, a, a little black devil sitting on one side, and you have a little, or a little red devil, and then you have a little white angel sitting on one side. You can listen to the devil or listen to the angel. This is a he. Okay, when we talk about at the last days, the coming of the lawless one, this is a, this is a he. And actually, he, he, um, verse 4 says, he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worship, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. So this is a literal person. And not only is he a literal person, but he's sitting in a literal temple. Now, there is no temple in Jerusalem right now. It was destroyed in 70 AD. But people through the ages that read the Bible and take it literally said there needs to be not only a regathering of Israel, but there needs to be a temple built in Israel. Uh, it says this, it says, And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So what we're going to be talking today is who is doing this restraining? Who is going to be doing this restraining? And that he needs to be restrained. Now, what's interesting is that going back to the second century, there were people that took what the Bible had to say literally. For example, Arrhenius. Now, Arrhenius was a scholar in the second century. I think he was born something like around 145, 150 AD. He lived, he was the Bishop of Lyons, which is in France. Christianity had spread all the way to France by that time. And he wrote this. He said, by the way, he was a disciple of Polycarp. Polycarp was a disciple of John. So he's one generation removed from John, who was an apostle of Jesus Christ. And, and Irenaeus writes this, he says, But when this Antichrist shall have devastated all things in the world, he will reign for three years and six months. That's 42, 42 months or 1260 days. He'll sit on the temple at Jerusalem, and then the Lord will come from heaven in the clouds in the glory of the Father, sending this man and those who follow him into the lake of fire, but bringing in for the righteous the times of the kingdom. So I say this because I want to give an historical account. There are many people, like I said, many people that don't take the book of Revelation. They don't take prophecy, and they don't try to read it literally. 
They say, oh, it's too difficult to understand. I see dragons and I see crowns and things like that. I, I can't possibly understand it. But if you take the Old Testament and let the Old Testament explain what's going on in the New Testament, you can take it as literally as possible. So when it says 42 months, we assume it's 42 months. When it says it's 1260 days, well, that happens to be 42 months. When it talks about seven years, it says seven years. When the Bible said that Israel will be regathered in the last days, many people believe that it couldn't possibly be true. But then in May of 1948, it happened. And things have, people have started looking at the Bible differently now than they were in the past, which makes a lot of sense. Sometimes um, prophecy is written in a way that the people at the present time don't understand it, but the people of the generation will understand it. There'll be a time when they'll understand it. So let's go on. Paul said the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. There were already forces of lawlessness that were struggling to move forward even in Paul's day. Now, we've mentioned the word antichrist. I want to make sure we understand what that is. It's only mentioned by John. It's not mentioned in the book of Revelation, but we know who he's talking about. When you say antichrist, you can take it two different ways. One, you can take it as against Christ. You can take it as something that's against Christ. The other thing, you can take it as another Christ. And we know both things will happen then in the last days there'll be a terrible persecution of the people that actually believe in Jesus Christ. At the same time, we, we find that the, this Antichrist, this man of lawlessness, will erect a statue and people will worship the Antichrist. They'll actually worship him. That's where the mark of the beast comes in. Unless you have the mark of the beast and you're worshiping the beast, you'll be martyred, you'll be persecuted. So this Antichrist means both against Christ as well as another Christ. So when we're going to talk about this restraining force, what is restraining, okay, I'm going to talk about the body of Christ. Because there's a parable of Jesus. We just talked about it a couple weeks ago, but I'm going to, it's, it's worth repeating. And that is Jesus calls us the salt of the earth and the light of the world. That's what it says. Jesus says, you are, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Then he says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on the stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You know, this saying that, that Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, is one of those parables that are it's relatively easy to understand because salt has some properties that we understand. Back in the days of Jesus, okay, they didn't have refrigeration. They also didn't have Ziploc bags, okay? If you know my wife, everything goes in a Ziploc bag, okay? The brownies go in a Ziploc bag. The cookies go in a Ziploc bag. She would put me in a Ziploc bag if she could find a big <laughs> enough one, right? Because in Florida, there's all kinds of critters that are out there. Unless you have a Ziploc bag, you're in trouble. Well, back then, they didn't have it, so they used salt. Salt was a preservative. They would salt the meat. They would salt the fish, and they would keep these things layered in salt, and it would preserve the food so they could do it. So salt is a preservative. Jesus says, you are the salt of the world. You're there preserving. You are restraining something. The other thing he says, the other thing with salt is that it also is a flavor enhancer, right? We have salt shakers, and you put it on good things and make them better, as long as you don't use too much salt. A little bit of salt goes a long way, but a little bit of salt is a flavor enhancer. Jesus said, you are the salt of the world. But I even like it even more that he says, you're the light of the world. You know, Jesus himself said that he was the light of the world, and that makes a lot of sense because he's God. He's the Son of God. He's the Messiah that came down from heaven, born as a baby, but died on a cross, died for our sins. I understand that he's the light of the world. But he says, you're the light of the world. Well, we've got... Two things in the sky. We've got a sun that gives light. We have a moon that reflects the light. But he says, no, you're not like the moon. You're not just reflecting who Jesus is. You've got the Holy Spirit living within you. You yourself are light. And we know what light does. Light casts away darkness. It chases away the darkness. It, it exposes evil. Jesus says, not only are you salt, but you're also to be light. You're to be the light of the world. So, I believe that this restrainer is the, the body of Christ. It's the Holy Spirit-filled disciples of Jesus. That's the restraining influence of the world today. And I believe it is the body of Christ. And notice I'm intentionally not saying church. 
And I, it doesn't have anything against church, except sometimes when you say church, people misunderstand it. They think that anybody that happens to go to church, would you mention the CEOs, right? Church Christmas and Easter only, people that maybe were baptized at one time, haven't been inside a church since the last wedding they went to, you know, when their daughter was married 35 years ago. Well, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about spirit filled, people that love God, that have been born again, that understand who Jesus Christ is, have made Jesus the Lord of their life. This is the Holy Spirit filled disciples of Jesus Christ. We are called to be disciples, to be born of the Spirit, to be salt and light. That's who we believe we are. I believe it is the body of Christ, those in the Holy, that whom the Holy Spirit indwells, that is presently the restraining force, creating the delay and the re revelation of the man of sin. And we know this to be true. We know that over the years, we know that when countries that were ruled by Christian people, suddenly the Christians were persecuted and somebody else came in, good went to bad very, very quickly. And we can count off the number of countries that that has happened. We don't want to look at our own country and our own political parties and say, well, it's that political party or this political party that is the evil one. That's a little bit too close to home. But we can see over a period of time. We know that over the last 2,000 years, it's the Christians that have been the salt and the light. They've been restraining force. You pray for your family. You pray for your sons and daughters. You pray for your grandkids. You pray for your neighbors. You're restraining the evil at the same time. You're restraining that evil. The body of Christ is, is what Jesus uses to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to welcome the stranger, and to preach the good news. Now, I know that it's a little controversial to say that it's the body of Christ because what we're talking about is this idea that the body of Christ is raptured out prior to the tribulation. And everybody doesn't believe that. And that God bless them, that's okay. But that's what I teach. I teach it because for three main reasons. So I'm going to basically show you three reasons why I believe, and I'm not even going to use this verse, three reasons why the scriptures tell us that it's the body of Christ, spirit-filled believers that will be taken out prior to the coming of the tribulation because they are the ones that are restraining the evil one. So number one, there's a marked difference between what we understand as the rapture and the second coming. The rapture is the occurrence of believers meeting Jesus in the air. Remember, Jesus said, I go away to prepare a place for you. I will come back. In 1 Thessalonians, okay, it says that he'll come back that, uh, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of a trumpet, the dead in Christ will rise, and we who are alive will meet them and be caught up together and meet them in the clouds. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the same type of event is called to be in the twinkling of an eye. It happens suddenly. Now, that's completely different than what the Old Testament's talked about with the coming of the Lord. Zechariah describes the coming of the Lord as he comes when Jerusalem is being attacked, when the Lord stands on the Mount of Olives and fights against all the nations. Revelation 1, uh, Jesus says, Look, I'm coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierce him, and all the peoples on the earth will mourn because of him. Verse 20 says that, that, and Jesus says in Matthew 24, he says, At that time the son of the son, the son of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, all the tribes in the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Remember also in the last uh, teaching we had in 1 Thessalonians, Paul said that Jesus returns with his saints. He returns with his saints. Which means the saints have to be with Jesus at some time prior so that they can come back with Jesus. Let's go on. That was, that was uh, reason number one. Reason number two. A time interval is needed between the rapture, the gathering of the body of Christ to be with Jesus in his Father's house, and the second coming, which happens at the end of the tribulation. This time interval is best harmonized as being the seven years of tribulation for a number of reasons. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5 teaches that all believers of this age must appear before Jesus at what's called the Bema Seat. Every believer dies goes to heaven and then is judged for their works. It's not a matter of salvation, it's a matter of rewards. You'll be accounted for everything that you've done in this body, both good and bad, and that's called the Bema Seat. And that happens in heaven prior to the return of Jesus. Also, in Revelation chapter 19, we see the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
Remember the marriage supper of the Lamb, that, that everybody's dressed in robes and they're all invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus describes himself often as the bridegroom and the church as the bride. The church goes up to heaven as the bride and meets with Jesus and has this marriage supper of the Lamb. It happens to be described in the beginning of chapter 19. At the end of chapter 19, the church returns with Jesus on horses to the earth. That's the second coming. So it happens prior to the second coming. Now, the rapture also, remember, can happen at any time. No one knows the day or the hour. Jesus, Paul said to be prepared. Uh, Jesus gave parables talking about the virgins waiting, not knowing when the bridegroom may come. It could happen at any time. It could have happened at any time during the last 2,000 years. However, the second coming is very described as exactly when it will happen. It will happen exactly 1,260 days after the Antichrist is revealed in the temple. It's also given as 42 months, or time, times, and half a time. The time is very specific. It's when Jerusalem is surrounded by the enemies, Jesus will return, and he'll land on the Mount of Olives. Here's the third one. The third of three of three, and this is the big one. We're told in Scripture that we are not, the body of Christ is, not destined for wrath. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 9 and 10. If you remember in the book of Revelation, the church of Philadelphia, there were seven, church, seven letters to seven churches. The church of Philadelphia was the most faithful of all the churches. There wasn't anything that was said negatively to the church of Philadelphia. They were the ones that said there's this door that's open for them to go out and proclaim the gospel. Jesus says this. He says, because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. So again, the church of Philadelphia was promised that they would escape this time. Jesus also, in, the, on the, um, in Matthew 24, compares his coming during, to the days of Noah as well as the days of Lot. Now, I find that interesting. I mean, he had, he had, he had thousands of years of Old Testament history going all the way back to, to the time of, of Genesis, to the time of the Judges, to the time of Adam and Eve. He could have picked any event that could have happened during that time. He picked those two events, Noah and the days of Lot. Well, what are they? Well, we know that it was a wicked time. There was a lot of wickedness going on. Uh, people were giving in marriage and doing different things. But both in those, both situations, Noah is rescued along with his family. They float above the waters of the deep, okay, which, which basically destroys all the rest of the people. Anybody that, anything that breathed air was died during that time. And the second thing was Lot. Now, the angels came to Lot and they said, come with us. We have to take you out of here because God's going to destroy Sodom. And they hesitated and they grabbed a hold of his hand. And they said, they grabbed his Lot by the hand and said, do not delay. We must get you out of the city for we cannot do anything. What were they going to do? They were going to rain fire and brimstone on the city until you are out of Sodom. So Jesus compares this time to the time of, time of Lot and of Noah. So let's finish up with an overview. Paul said, Paul said that there's a mystery of lawlessness that was already there. I believe that's that evil force, that evil force that constantly is trying to take what God made, meant for good and turn it for evil. But God has always had a restraining force. He's always had a restraining force. And I believe for the last 2,000 years, it's been the church. Spirit-filled believers where God dwells in us. Paul said that we, have, we are the temple of God because the Holy Spirit dwells within us. And we've been restraining evil for 2,000 years. You don't realize what your, the effect that your prayers have and the impact that you have on your family and your friends and your nation for that matter. But we are the restraining force. Paul said, do you not remember that I told you when I was still with you, I told you these things. See, Paul is holding back on us now. He, we're not sure exactly what he told them, but we could surmise based on what the scripture says that this restraining force is none other than the, the believers filled with the Spirit of God. You know, back in the time of Paul and, and after that, some of, the, some of the scholars believed it was maybe the Roman Empire. Maybe the Roman Empire, as evil as they were, were the restraining force against this man of lawlessness. Well, the Roman Empire has come and gone, and we're still here. Um, there will be a day that when God restrains evil, uh, and he does this to forward his perfect plan and purposes, but then there will be a time when he removes or re removes that restrainer, 
And he does that for his, the same reason, for his perfect purposes. You know, there are people today that look around the world and they say things are falling apart. Things are falling apart. Maybe, maybe not. I haven't been around as long as some of you. Maybe you've seen things that are worse, but a lot of people, they take a look at the world today and they say it looks like things are falling apart. However, if you read the Bible, it could be that things are falling in place. Things are falling in place. Jesus is about to return. The thing that happens before he returns is he, re he removes that which has been restraining. And I believe that I've taught what is restraining is, in fact, the church. Now, one of the things that, that is, is, is good is to understand that this evil one, this man of perdition, this man of sin, the lawless one, the Antichrist, his reign is very short. Short is maybe three and a half years. Maybe seven years at the max, but probably three and a half years. Um, he'll only be permitted absolute authority for 42 months, three and a half years, time, time, and half a time, that his fury will go unchecked. In Revelation, this person is called the beast. He'll also be the Antichrist. He'll be the one that is, will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that's called God or his worship so that he sets himself up in God's temple. There's that word again, proclaiming himself to be God. I'll close with these words out of Revelation. Revelation chapter 19 says this. This is after Jesus returns. And he says, And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse. That's Jesus. And against his army. That's the saints as well as the heavenly hosts. Then the beast will be captured, and with him the false prophet who works signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive in the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Remember, friends, that after the rapture, God moves on the hearts of the Jewish people, as well as countless Gentiles who decide not to worship the beast. Many, if not our most, are martyred, but God continues to minister to the people after the rapture of the church. Jesus said, we should work while it is still day. As long as it's day, let us do the work of God. That's John 9. Because soon it will be very difficult to accomplish spiritual work. <laughs> Lawlessness is now presently being restrained. You are, however, the salt of the earth, the light of the world. It's time to make a difference. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you, Lord. We thank you that in these four or five verses, Lord, there's so much that we can learn. We thank you, Lord.